Hello everyone. Um, I appreciate you all coming. Um, it's probably partly Sarah's doing, seeing as her session also isn't on. Um, and Sarah is the reason that I joined the NDF when I came to New Zealand. So I'll give a shout out to her because she'll probably see this afterwards. Um, yep, my name's Leanne Ross, as you can probably tell by the accent. I'm from Ireland, although it sounds a bit more British because I'm from Northern Ireland, which is technically in the UK, geographically in Ireland, and it's very complicated. We, for, we fought a war over it, let's not talk about it. Um, <laughs> but um, I live here now, I'm married to a Kiwi. I've been in New Zealand based in Dunedin for a year on the 5th of December. Um, and uh, the reason that I joined NDF is not because I work in the glam sector, so like a lot of the people that have come and talked over the last two days to share their learnings um, with you all, it comes from a passion for the sector as, as a visitor, as a user, as a citizen, a global citizen. Um, and so there's a serious imposter syndrome um, because this is honestly one of the best conferences I've ever been to. I've been to a lot, I've spoken a lot. Um, in terms of what you're sharing, um, your attitude, the, the detail and the knowledge that's coming through. So hopefully this session will be a little bit more just about either giving you some inspiration creatively from things that are happening elsewhere. More often than not, what I find with things like this is that you realize you're doing the same things or you're already doing better. And for a small nation to a small nation, I know how important that is to get that confidence that actually you're not behind, you're leading the way. So if all you go away with is confidence that, you know, compared to the UK or Ireland, you're doing a really good job, then I have done my job and you can enjoy your coffee for the afternoon. Um, so it, often when you come from a small place like Ireland that is so steeped in history, and an awful lot of people have said to me when I came here, don't you miss the history? You know, don't you miss the ancient ruins? Um, and I do in one sense and in the other sense I don't. What I've found in New Zealand and the, the parts of it that I've been to and everywhere I go from Nelson all the way down to the North Island, I will try and get to a gallery, I will get to a museum and a library. It's how I judge a country really. Um, and good for you, you're all doing it quite well. <laughs> Although I miss it, you know, New Zealand has such a rich history and culture and the stories that you tell are so emotive. And so that's really pleasantly surprising for someone who moves from somewhere that's considered to have such a such a long and, and rich history to come to somewhere that the rest of the world considers to be relatively young in the grand scheme of, of civilizations. But actually, there's an awful lot in common between Ireland and New Zealand. There are two islands that um, economically rely quite heavy on tourism and it's a tourism industry that is fueled um, in both nations by the stories that you're telling and stories about your place and stories about your people um, and so while I could list you know lots of things that the two places have in common um, one of the most poignant um, and compelling for people like me who come from Europe is the stories um, that link the two nations um, stories like this one that I'll just put up briefly. This is my husband's mum, is one of the young girls in this photo. Um, and that's Belfast, which is my home city. And they emigrated here in the 70s in the height of the troubles during the war. Um, and an emigration journey like mine, but not like mine, because they spent two months on a boat and I spent 36 hours and moaned about it on a plane. But the fact is that these are really profound stories and they're passed down from generation to generation. And that, you know, the concept that has been talked about over and over again at this conference is that essentially that is what history is and it, it is your storytelling. Um, and it's the job of museums to tell those stories that we're not actually profoundly linked to sometimes. Sometimes they're stories that don't interest us. Sometimes they don't have um, a personal, you know, they don't resonate for us. Sometimes they're actually deeply uncomfortable for us and we don't want to have to hear those stories, but they're important um, nonetheless. So, um, what I want to talk about today is some examples of how those stories are being told to younger generations um, using technology and, and why that is um, an important thing to try and do for museums. So um, I know that it's important, not just because I love 
history and museums and galleries and arts and culture, but I know it because I'm actually an agent of the change that sort of threatens the way that you've traditionally done things. Um, Runaway Play is a games development studio in Dunedin and it's a company that I'm currently working for, although I've consulted with lots of different businesses and industries over the years. Um, they too, they make um, games that are based factually, they're based on nature. Um, and they're all about a love of conservation and trying to get people out into nature and trying to give people access to the facts about nature if they can't get outside. Um, and yet the next game that they're going to be launching in December is a virtual reality game. So it's bringing those very environments into people's homes. Um, and a lot of people would argue that that's actually counterproductive to the whole campaign to get people out, to get them physically experiencing things. Um, but the fact is that I'm someone who's been on holiday to Egypt. I've been inside a pyramid. I was 16 to this day. It's the best holiday I've ever had. Nothing will top it. Um, but the fact is that not everybody can do that. Not everyone can experience that for a myriad of different reasons. And those are experiences that over time, as everything gets older and needs to be preserved, there are experiences that mightn't actually be open to everyone. They might have to close for good. So we have to recognise that there will be a place to artificially experience some of that history and some of those stories. So the first lesson that I want to talk about and give an example of is partnerships. That's been talked about a lot, um, collaborations here. Um, one of the things that I've heard about in the other sessions about thing, technologies like VR and AR and this sort of thing is that they're very expensive. Um, there isn't an awful lot of adoption in terms of the, the pace of um, the development of headsets and the cost of designing them. Um, so this is one example of how there is a lot of funding available from companies whose best interest it is in for people to adopt technologies um, to try and you know, leverage that funding so that you can get the help from them to develop such products. So one of them was Google Street View. I don't know if anyone saw this. Um, Ireland 2016 joined forces with Google Street View to mark a special year in the nation's history. So it was the, the 100 year anniversary of um, the Easter Rising, which was when the rebels fought Britain for Irish independence. Um, it's an award winning virtual tour, um, but really the whole aim of it was to bring the stories um, of the rebellion to life for people, whether they were on foot physically in Dublin or whether they were anywhere in the world and all they had was a device and it was six cultural institutions that came together to provide the stories and the artifacts for it and um, still available online if you want to look it up and take a look um, and basically through the tour um, which was narrated by um, Hollywood Irish actor Colin Farrell which is either a pro or a con depending on your personal preference for Colin Farrell um, <laughs> So visitors were able to stop um, in front of city locations like this one, which is the GPO, um, and they could explore photos, videos, um, there was personal letters and witness statements that had been narrated, and um, there was artifacts and photos of those um, that people could look at. And now we know that walk-in tours aren't anything new. You know, countries around the world are using those for 24-7 tourism access. Um, but the use of the Google technology in this partnership it gave it the ability to lay over lots of different images. Um, it meant that a lot of cultural institutions could bring their stories together in a narrative that was really seamless for someone who knew nothing about it. Um, and it really brought a tiny country's sort of important story to a global audience. And that's particularly important for nations like Ireland or New Zealand, where there are a huge number of people dotted all around the place who can't physically get back for an important event like that. Um, the second lesson, I do want to touch on um, VR and AR. Um, and I talk about this while being really aware and very passionate about the fact that I will always believe that physically inside a museum is a very important and wonderful place for people to be. It's why I've brought my son since before he could talk. Um, but I still think that there is a place for this technology. Um, and the, the example I want to show you um, is from Titanic Belfast. I don't know if anyone has been as far as Belfast. Um, but obviously when, when Belfast opened its own Titanic Museum, it came with a, an awful lot of press. And um, 
back in 2012 it was this big impressive hull shaped building it was on you know, the shipyard actual slipway that the Titanic, Titanic came off from and, and obviously that's a story for Belfast as a city that is extremely important to who it feels it is and its place in the world um, but the 360 degree tour which is kind of a an offshoot of a way to do VR without having headsets and give people that kind of similar experience. It ended up becoming a real standout piece for the museum. Um, now, I want to show you, I have a video, it's only a few minutes long, and I want you to bear in mind that it's been taken on someone's phone, so it's not the same as when you stand and you look around and that's all you can see, but it'll just help you when I try and explain why I feel it works. So hopefully this works because they've embedded it. Now, it keeps going on and on. It takes you up out into the sea. The reason that I show you that is because, in my opinion, the reason why something like that works so well in the museum, and this is a museum that has personal letters, things that have been pulled from the shipwreck. It has a Disneyland ride that goes around a shipyard with workers in it and the smells and the sounds. And yet that becomes a standout piece in a museum where you can go on to a replica of the staircase and have a Kate Winslet selfie, which we've all had. When we're, we've all had one. And that's brilliant and that's fantastic. But why is a 360 degree tour the one that everyone shares and the one that everyone talks about? And it's because for the first time for us, it shows the scale of it, the sheer scale of it and the sounds and the way the lighting changes and the, and so when you get to the end of museum the museum and we all know how the story ends and we've all heard it and we've all been touched by it but it's so much more impactful when you feel the size of it and you just think hi and the people and the why and the, so and that's why because really for a lot of modern audiences we have to work so much harder to make them feel and we have to make them feel so that they really grasp 
the enormity of some of the stories that we're telling. Um, there are museums like the Epic Museum here in Dublin who are trying to experiment and partner with companies to make their own VR sort of programs and they are working really well especially among school kids who you know you're trying to tell them this dramatic story of Irish immigration from the Dublin Docklands you know and their ancestors and really they sort of need to be able to see the people and hear the noises and see the ships because it's just so far removed from the life that they're living. Um, but these technologies can be used for fun as well and there's nothing wrong with a bit of fun while we're trying to educate people. Um, the Wax Museum in Dublin used some AR technology when they relaunched to sort of um, gamify the place in a Pokemon Go style um, and yes it was a bit of a treasure hunt and this sort of thing for children but actually what worked really well for adults was when they placed their smartphones over the wax models the faces moved and the voices told the story that you would traditionally read on a card beside it and it just gave people that that something extra that really made them pay attention and feel um, and again that's always what we're trying to do and, and this kind of technology is being used more and more you know you've got galleries who are using it whenever there's um, sort of artistic masterpiece ex exhibits coming in and out so and it does it just does work really well because as much as we don't as much as we would love people to put their phone down for five minutes the fact is that they're so used to using it and they're so used to sharing with it that it does kind of pique their interest um, and so there's no real harm in doing that you know where appropriate the second last lesson is digital lifestyles and this is an important one that I want to share because I feel like an awful lot of the challenges for organizations that are very tight on budgets is that you're constantly trying to find ways to bring the technology in um, and actually you can just take your message out to where the technology already is, the platforms already are, people are already hanging out. So one good example of this was the Guinness Storehouse. This is um, one of the biggest, it's really the top tourist attraction. It has over a million and a half visitors a year. So this is where Arthur Guinness and the factory and the black stuff was traditionally and still is brewed. Um, but they had a challenge where they actually wanted to attract more international visitors. Um, and they wanted to bring the museum to a place where it was more than a museum it was more like a lifestyle choice so it was a place that people wanted to come and hang out and it was seen as a cool place to be so they partnered with Airbnb and they came up with a campaign on St Patrick's Day where the Guinness storehouse was turned into a luxury apartment and it was listed as the most exclusive residence to stay on St Patrick's Day obviously you couldn't buy it because there was only one and um, it was it was a competition and a lucky couple won it and again you can look um, some of the information up about this online but the great thing about this is that they didn't have to create the technology for it. They just had to partner with someone else who already had the audience they were looking for. And they just had to be a little bit creative with it and a bit more fun. Um, and the offshoot is that they got tons of PR coverage, tons of social media discussions and sharing. And it was all amongst that target demographic that they sometimes struggle to get inside somewhere stiff and boring like a museum um, and all of a sudden it was a cool place because it knows who Airbnb is and you know it's a cool, it's, it's got this fun competition and maybe it's a place we want to go and and it really worked and it's a good lesson not because it was fun and quirky and we all think we're cool but because it worked because it got the audiences talking about it and it got them in the door and the last lesson I want to briefly touch on is social communications I think you all do this really well um, I am um, spend a lot of my life online unfortunately for my husband and my child um, but I do you know watch how a lot of the museums and galleries and libraries here are communicating on social media and they do it really well um, but a simple way to both do research about whether or not your messages are hitting the right audiences and also to reach new audiences at the same time is to take a bit of a risk sometimes and hand your channels over to some of those audiences um, and I can see marketing people completely freaking out and that's okay but like it can be done and it can work well so bear with me. Um, I'm from Northern Ireland which is extremely risk averse, very traditional, religiously oppressed some might say um, by its political system but even there um, three of the top museums, the Ulster Museum, Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, Ulster American Folk Park, they all took part in an initiative called the Teen Twitter Takeover Day try and say that before afternoon coffee. Um, it's the brainchild of a UK wide organization called Kids in Museums you've probably heard of and it's all about connected museums with teenagers and as the guys in the talk before me um, spoke about you know that this is an audience that is particularly at risk from disengaging 
with history and culture, an audience some of us would argue are in particular need of engaging with history and culture, and they're also heavily reliant on digital technologies. Um, so the museum brought them in and allowed them to take over their channels for the day after being warned about what they could and couldn't say. Um, this is some of the offshoot of what they came up with and yes some of it's very fun, it's very fluffy, but what the museums were able to gather from that was how they were talking to their peers and saying you know how do they communicate, they want to share, they expect to come into a museum and be told that mobile phones are banned and they have to have a respectful silence and they think it's a stuffy place and they can't have any fun and so they're able to share in that way and the museums were able to find out how you young people talk about these kinds of things and um, what they wanted to know about the artifacts and what what channels do they want to be communicated with on um, and the Los Angeles um, County Museum of Art has won numerous awards for doing this on their snapchat um, one of the most famous ones is a Roman statue that's sort of dancing and the, they said that Beyonce stole the moves from there um, because it just says all the single ladies underneath it. It's fantastic. And so many young people engaged with this content and came to the museum, specifically because they thought the museum has a personality and they get me on my level. And so that's a purposeful strategy for them that has actually won them a ton of awards. It saw them beat off the Met and the Museum of Modern Art for a cultural engagement award. Um, again, not because it was quirky and cool, but because it delivered results and it actually worked. So, to close, I believe that the stories that museums have to tell are really vital for the informed advancement of our society. Um, we undoubtedly want to visit them. We will always want to be in the physical presence of artifacts. We will always feel emotionally overwhelmed by that experience the first time anyone does it and the more that we do it, the more that we get out of it in our lives. We don't just want to see digital reimaginings of things we never that will never be enough for us but at the same time it would be naive of us to think that technology isn't changing our preferences for how we communicate how we take in information where we want to hang out where we want to spend our time so there's no reason why that technology the fun and the excitement and the interest that it brings has to be excluded from the work that the glam sector does um, in order to actually help you to achieve your aims. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs>